Review copy provided by NIS America. The Japanese role-playing game has seen an interesting and varied history in the West. While Final Fantasy VII would act as many a young gamer's gateway JRPG, myself included, allowing for Western localizations to skyrocket in the PS1 era, the genre would begin to become less and less prevalent after the PS2 outside of Japan. Such events were in no small part due to the popularization of other genres like the first-person shooter or the open-world sandbox being led by juggernaut franchises like Call of Duty and Grand Theft Auto. Such a trend was compounded further by many big names in the genre taking a less traditional approach with their design philosophies, moving away from the active time battle system, turn-based combat systems, and heavy dialogue-based storytelling in favour of more action-packed, fluid, real-time experiences. Thanks a lot, Lightning. Just kidding, we all know the real problem with Final Fantasy XIII was a boring and repetitive gameplay loop, and despite the inclusion of a good combat system and some interesting narrative concepts, it failed to deliver largely due to poor pacing, exposition, and design choices. Still, in recent years, the more traditional JRPG has seen somewhat of a renaissance, with big budget entries like Persona 5 and Dragon Quest XI experiencing great success in Western markets both critically and commercially. But nevertheless, there was a brief period in the last console generation when it seemed as if the JRPG genre was on the wane, shrinking further into obscurity for Western fans, and becoming a landscape with little on the horizon that didn't have to be searched out or recommended in smaller and smaller fan communities. However, in such uncertain times where many thought that the genre's glory days were behind them for those outside of Japan, there was one console still producing gems of the genre, many of which were very much in the traditional mould. While it couldn't boast the library of the incredible JRPGs seen on the PlayStation 1, the Nintendo 3DS would do its best to compete, with titles like Bravely Default, Fire Emblem Awakening, Radiant Historia Perfect Chronology, Persona Q 1 and 2, the list goes on and on, and many of these would take a well-earned place as the best examples of the genre for fans. Put simply, such a catalogue would allow many to find what was in short supply on the PlayStation 3, Xbox 360 and PC. And while there are undoubtedly amazing examples of the genre available on those platforms, such as the magnificent Lost Odyssey and the recently remastered classic Tales of Vesperia, the 3DS would help mediate the situation with a steady stream of classic-style JRPGs that many of us were missing from the genre's golden era in the 1990s. In early 2015, the 3DS would release The Legend of Legacy in Japan, with the United States receiving a localised version of the game in October of the same year, and Europe seeing a release a few months later in February of 2016. Developed by Tokyo-based developer Cattle Call and published by Furyu in Japan, Atlas in the US and NIS in PAL territories, The Legend of Legacy was perhaps more than any other example an intentional effort to recapture some of the lost magic from a bygone era of the genre. Such an era was one specifically enjoyed by perhaps the most prolific producer of quality titles within the JRPG landscape, developer Squaresoft, or Square Enix as they're now known. To this end, Cattle Call would seek out talent from Square's heyday and many veterans of the company were hired for The Legend of Legacy, including designer Koji Koizumi and illustrator Tomomi Kobayashi from the popular Romancing Saga series, Masato Kato, who had been a chief creative figure on classics like Chrono Trigger, Chrono Cross, Xenogears and Final Fantasy VII and XI, and Masayo Asano, who had also worked on many entries in the Final Fantasy series. Rounding out this list of veterans was the game's director, Masataka Matsura, who was mainly known for his work on the Zero Escape franchise, but had also worked on various other titles over his career. However, despite such a pedigree and a strong first week in Japan, The Legend of Legacy would ultimately underperform both critically and commercially, failing to meet sales expectations and receiving middling reviews. But, as always should be the case, such a failure would be turned into an opportunity for improvement, and while The Legend of Legacy undoubtedly had many positive qualities, it perhaps would serve best as an indicator of areas that required improvement going forward. The summer of 2017 heralded the release of Cattle Call's follow-up to The Legend of Legacy in Japan, with the rest of the world seeing it the following year in March of 2018. Once again released as a 3DS exclusive, 
the Alliance Alive would end up being an improvement in almost every way over its predecessor, and would also see a much healthier critical and commercial response. However, there was another problem that the Alliance Alive would have to overcome. While the 3DS had provided the aforementioned respite for JRPG fans over a few sparse years, its time in the sun was reaching its end by early 2018, with Nintendo instead throwing their support behind their new hybrid console, the Switch. But luckily for Cattle Call, the 3DS exclusivity would not be a permanent one, and in October 2019, the Alliance Alive would see release not only on the Switch, but also on PC and PlayStation 4. And on top of this, the re-release would also come in the form of a more definitive HD remastered version. So with such a long and storied journey to get into the hands of many JRPG fans, is the Alliance Alive worth your hard-earned money and precious time? Well, for the most part, I'd say, yeah, it probably is. As mentioned earlier, the Alliance Alive's development was in many ways an attempt to address many of the flaws seen in its predecessor. Standing as more of a spiritual successor to The Legend of Legacy than a sequel, the objective here seemed to be to refine instead of overhaul, and there are a few areas of the game where this is better illustrated than the game's story. While the narrative team's pedigree on The Legend of Legacy was undeniably impressive, for The Alliance Alive the developer would go the extra mile and hire Yoshitaka Moriyama, a figure known for writing two of the greatest JRPGs ever made. Suikoden and Suikoden 2. Such a choice would pay off, and while not Moriyama's best work, the story here is one that balances old-school pacing with interesting, mature themes, including racism, nationalism, classism, and social segregation. The game tells the story of a world taken over and subjugated by demons. While their motivations initially remain a mystery, these enigmatic foes have separated each area of the world from one another, using a barrier named the Dark Current. Interestingly, the events of the game begin around 1,000 years after this has occurred, meaning blue skies and worlds beyond the barrier are now simply unsubstantiated legends among the now lower class human population. On top of this, the human race is also kept in line by a race of beast folk who enjoy a middle class status in the societal order, serving the demons to keep themselves in relative luxury. The tale follows several different characters who, by chance or by choice, all become part of a human resistance group named the Night Crows. While their initial plan is simply to fight for human rights, they soon resolve to remove the barrier and discover the truth behind the demon's motivations. While this is an interesting premise, which facilitates the exploration of many poignant themes, the real strength in this game's narrative is its pacing and structure. So often in JRPGs, great ideas get lost or hidden by bad delivery and execution. But The Alliance Alive has almost perfect pacing for much of its 25 to 40 hours, and utilises interesting and diverse narrative techniques to deliver its story at a great pace. While I don't want to say too much, I'll give you one spoiler-free example. Expectedly, the first third or so of the Alliance Alive's narrative is mainly concerned with establishing each character and their motivations as well as the world as a whole. While many a JRPG would do this by having each character join the team and after an hour or so drop a large exposition dump about themselves, the world or both, the Alliance Alive instead employs a different approach. Multi-perspectivity is a narrative technique seen in various media, made famous by the likes of Akira Kurosawa with his 1950 classic movie Rashomon, as well as various other texts both in and outside of popular culture. In short, multi-perspectivity involves showing the same event or set of events from various perspectives in order to facilitate both narrative progression, story revelation and character exposition. The Alliance Alive utilises this technique to create a refreshing and satisfying first act to its story which, while a little predictable in places, makes it much more character-centric. Each section cuts between sets of characters allowing for great compartmentalised development and culminates in them all finally coming together to start their adventure proper. It gives each character room to breathe and allows for exposition that doesn't feel forced or contrived. Of course, this is just one example of how the Alliance Alive tells an engaging JRPG narrative, and there are plenty more peppered throughout. While it's true that some of its characters are a little tropey, and it can occasionally fall a little flat. Its great pacing and method of delivery elevate it above your average genre fare. In many ways, The Alliance Alive feels like it's trying to evoke memories of a forgotten era, and given the fact that much of the development team is comprised of ex-Square staff, famous for producing titles in the genre's golden years, such a theory feels more than a little substantiated. Few areas illustrate this better than the game's design philosophy and gameplay systems. Remember world maps? Turn-based combat? Text-only dialogue with no voice acting? Well, they're all here, and for the most part, they feel delightfully nostalgic in the best possible sense. I say for the most part, because there are a few issues that this throws up. 
some of which could be attributed to the Alliance Alive HD's existence as a 3DS port, but we'll talk about those in a bit, as they fall more under presentation than gameplay or design. Still, what is worth talking about in this section of the review is the game's combat and levelling systems. Essentially, the way it works is characters have no traditional levels and earn no XP for battles. Instead, fighting enemies will boost whatever stat was most utilised within the conflict a small amount. So, say you use a lot of magic attacks when defeating an enemy, then that will increase your magic stats by a small amount. It's a system similar to those seen fleetingly in other JRPGs, such as Final Fantasy II for example, but more refined, better implemented and less exploitable. Strangely, while such a system has its drawbacks, it actually makes more sense narratively that stats would only increase based on the player's actions, rather than all stats arbitrarily increasing each level, regardless of how the player has chosen to battle. On top of this is the Awakening system, which randomly unlocks new abilities for each character in battle. While this might seem like it could break the game or allow for it to become frustrating, new abilities unlock at a well-balanced pace throughout, and it never feels skewed or hindered by the system, instead creating an interesting dynamic. The other potential downside for a system like this is it could remove some of the player agency when levelling up. Luckily, the Alliance Alive has several other systems at play, which mean this isn't the case. After defeating enemies, your team is also rewarded with TP, or talent points. These can be used to unlock stat boosts, weapon skills and other new abilities. Moreover, a few hours into the game, you unlock an ultimate attack ability, which will activate based on how much damage you have taken during any given battle. While such elements have been seen in many other JRPGs, such as Final Fantasy VII's Limit Breaks, the difference here is that performing such an attack in the Alliance Alive will break that character's currently equipped weapon, rendering it unusable until it is either repaired or replaced. Much like many of the other elements found within the Alliance Alive, this sounds like it could be annoying, but actually it's a great way of injecting a risk-reward system into certain battles. It really makes you consider your actions and also encourages the player to pick their moment instead of simply firing off an ultimate attack the minute it becomes available. On top of all of this, you have the fact that enemies can be seen on the map and avoided by the player, meaning encounters are not random like in many other JRPGs of this type. You're also able to chain enemies together before entering combat in order to fight several battles in a row and gain better loot and rewards as well as more TP. While enemies can sometimes move quickly and prove harder to avoid than perhaps they should, this system again has more pros than cons, for several reasons. Firstly, as new ability unlocks can happen at any moment, fighting even the weakest of enemies has the chance to significantly increase the player's power level. Secondly, HP or health points in the Alliance Alive refill after every battle, but SP or skill points do not. Skill points are used to perform certain attacks and also cast magic, so must be carefully maintained and rationed throughout battles. Luckily, regular attacks will slowly refill the SP meter in battle too, albeit at an incredibly slow pace, meaning there's always an option for the player, even if it's an undesirable one. Taken together, this means that fighting multiple enemies at once creates a risk-reward situation as you have to fight longer without your HP being replenished and must also use more SP in order to dispatch all the foes, but you'll also reap better rewards and gain significant power for seeing the battles through. All of this culminates in an experience which does away with a lot of the grinding that is often present in the genre. Much like other contemporary examples like Bravely Default, it's as if the developer was seeking to maintain the essence of the genre's established combat, but remove some of the inherent tedium. Such a hypothesis is further compounded by the inclusion of a speed-up mechanic, which allows battles to be played at either two or four times speed with the press of a button. Such a feature is one that has made its way into many re-releases of classic entries in the genre in recent years, and its optional nature makes it a great addition for newcomers and purists alike. The final element that affects battles in the Alliance Alive is the Alliance Tower system. As you progress through the game, you create alliances with various outposts throughout different regions of the world. This in turn leads to randomised special attacks, beneficial buffs and debuffs, and various other positive actions triggered on occasion during battle. While these can never be relied upon due to their potential irregularity, they are always a pleasant surprise when they occur, and saved my skin more than once during my time with the Alliance Alive. Outside of combat and levelling, the Alliance Alive is relatively standard JRPG fare. There's dungeon exploration, mild puzzle solving, and some small optional activities here and there, but for the most part, the player will be focused on progressing through the game's main story, and even this feels like a remnant of the classics of the genre. In fact, many of those involved have said that a common element back in the 1990s, especially in the Final Fantasy series, was to prioritise the main plot over all else, keeping side content to a minimum, or only having much of it accessible after the main bulk of the story was complete. The Alliance Alive in many ways follows this formula, prioritising old-school pacing which keeps you invested in the story over the implementation of addictive and lengthy side content.
I guess it's here that the bulk of the criticism can be levelled at the Alliance Alive HD. As a port of a 3DS game, there were obviously lower expectations for both visual and audio fidelity, but despite such drawbacks, it gets by for the most part due to nice art direction and decent if a little generic character design. However, there are just a few areas where the remaster treatment could have been a little more comprehensive. Firstly, many of the character models and art assets look low quality in places, a factor no doubt highlighted by the game's 1080p image upscale. It's not terrible and a lot of the game looks surprisingly good, but the odd low poly asset or texture can take you out of the experience. However, the weirdest omission from the Alliance Alive HD Remastered is the lack of voice acting. Now, don't get me wrong, this is not because voice acting is required in a game like this. In fact, most of the greatest JRPGs ever made have only text dialogue, and I often think this is a better choice in the genre, as voice acting can so often ruin things. I grew up with no parents, but there was one priest in Wendo that was always nice to me. Heath was kind and helpful. He took care of me. My grandpa asked Heath to go to Astoria to look into something for the temple. But I got a really, really bad feeling about However, because of how the other elements of the game's presentation are implemented, it simply feels like it should have been there, but was removed. It's a little difficult to explain, but essentially many of the game's cutscenes are portrayed in an incredibly cinematic way, with quality animations, camera angles, and even mouth movements for dialogue. However, despite this, all scenes are played with only limited sound effects and low-level music. This creates a jarring aesthetic and tone to many of the game's scenes, and also means you are often left watching a conversation play out after having already read all of the text as you wait for the next person to speak. One of the pluses of older JRPGs that didn't have voice acting was that you were free to experience the dialogue at your own pace and also allow for each line to be absorbed at a speed you were comfortable with. The downside of this, of course, is that you miss out on potential quality voice performances which can allow for different inflections that can radically alter how any given scene is consumed and digested by the player. The Alliance Alive often feels like it's getting the worst of both worlds here, Scenes are long enough and grandiose enough to feel like they should have been performed to the player, but elements of that performance seem like they're missing, leading to a strange confliction of tone and execution that can occasionally feel weird in places. However, all of this feels like a layover from the limitations of the hardware on which the game was originally developed, and so is a much easier pill to swallow. Also, these elements are generally adjusted to after a few hours of play, and end up feeling like an intermittent qualm over a game-breaking criticism. But unfortunately, these are not the only issues when it comes to the Alliance Alive HD Remastered. Firstly, there's no real added content here on any format, which, while not required, would have further incentivized fans, especially when considering its standard price is almost double that of the 3DS version. As it stands now, the HD visual upgrade doesn't quite feel like it justifies the hike in price, meaning waiting for a sale might be preferable, especially for those who've already experienced the game in its original form. Also, for some unknown reason, the PC version of the game has no mouse and keyboard support at all and requires a controller to play. While I understand that the game may have always been designed with some kind of controller layout in mind, given its origins on Nintendo's portable console, this seems completely baffling to me. Almost all of its contemporaries and re-releases in the genre, from as long ago as three decades, pretty much universally have some form of mouse and keyboard support. Turn-based JRPGs are not reaction-based games and generally don't require Twitch-style control schemes often favouring tactics-based gameplay over dynamic, real-time combat. This is especially true for the Alliance Alive, which has no sections that couldn't be played with a keyboard and mouse. While I understand that such a control scheme wouldn't be optimal, and the best way to play would always be with a controller, the omission of even the option is a real shame. So let's talk a little about music in the Alliance Alive, which was composed by Square Enix veteran Masashi Hamauzu. Hamauzu, who is possibly most famous for his work on the Final Fantasy XIII trilogy, has also worked on many other high-profile projects over the years, including the Romancing Saga series, Final Fantasy X, and most recently, the Final Fantasy VII Remake. While not his best or most memorable work, the Alliance Alive soundtrack is nonetheless one of its standout features, and sits nicely alongside many of the composer's other works, standing as distinctive enough to set it apart, but still recognisable for fans. While Hammer Uzu has never quite reached the heights of the unrivaled master of the JRPG soundtrack, Nobuo Uematsu, whose work on the Final Fantasy series remains the greatest work in the genre, he is still a force to be reckoned with within the industry, and his work here only reinforces such a status. All in all, The Alliance Alive was a great looking 3DS game with impressive production values that has unfortunately been humbled significantly in the remaster by the much more powerful hardware on which it now finds itself. Still, despite this, it looks and sounds good enough to convey the tone it was going for, 
and while it could never be called the best looking JRPG on current platforms, PS4, PC and Switch are still great places to experience it. In terms of performance, the Alliance Alive runs pretty much as you would expect, considering how much more power it now has at its disposal. Still, it's worth pointing out that this is a fine port in almost all areas, with only the odd frame drop here and there, which are no doubt due to the fact that it started life on vastly different architecture. It's also worth noting that the UI is well designed and converted from the 3DS version, especially when you consider that the original game utilised two screens, but now only one is available. In terms of replay value, the Alliance Alive offers a relatively standard JRPG experience, with a basic New Game Plus and a rebalanced EX New Game Plus on offer, which allows you to carry over some of your progress from the last playthrough, or gives you a bunch of talent points to use at the game's opening. Personally, I felt little need for a second run once I'd rolled credits, and while I can see myself returning on one rainy afternoon to embark on the quest for the elusive 100% completion, it feels like that day is some ways into my future. The Alliance Alive is definitely a JRPG worth experiencing for fans of the genre's so-called golden age. It feels in many ways like a game released in the late 1990s, and it's clear in almost all areas of its design and execution that this was always the intention. In fact, fans of classic entries in the JRPG's long and complicated history may find something here simply due to the impressive list of veteran designers and creative minds behind the project. While it does have some flaws, occasionally gets a little too informed by its past, and suffers from hit and miss execution, especially regarding its existence as a remaster, the Alliance Alive succeeds in recapturing at least some of the magic of the genre's bygone era. And as any old school JRPG fan will tell you, that in itself is no easy feat. <laughs>